everybody. Today we have Diana Robb here, and we are talking about her book, Writing for Bliss. And I am so blissed out just even thinking about talking to you because I am what you describe as an emerging writer, and I have all sorts of questions. So thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, so the first question. So you actually have seven steps in your um, in your book, and it seemed like some of them were kind of... Uh, kind of process oriented. Um, some of them were like mood setting, but maybe all of them are process oriented. I wanted to talk to you first, like how did these seven steps integrate into your own writing process and tell us about your experience with writing? Cause you were a writer before, whereas I'm a, I don't know, an emerging writer, whatever that means. Well, I'll start with your second question. Maybe that would make more sense. So I began writing at the age of 10, uh, when my mother gave me a journal, Cahill Gibran journal, to help me cope with my grandmother's suicide. She was my caretaker. And so from that day on, I looked towards writing during difficult times in my life. And uh, I've been writing for over 50 years, and it's just what I do because I love to do it. Um, most writers write because they have to write, not necessarily because they want to write. It's just mm -hmm. something that gained them. Mm -hmm. So... I started as a medical journalist, and then I went into personal writing and poetry. So that's a little bit about my background. And your second question was about the seven steps, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how they integrate in your whole. How did you come up with the writing process? Is this the one that you use? And if so, how you put them all together? Yeah, that's a great question. The reason I actually came up with this book is the basis of my dissertation, my PhD work on writing for healing. Mm. And I yeah, and I uh, interviewed some very prestigious writers and how they use writing to heal in their own personal lifestyle. And then I began teaching workshops. And what I found during the workshops is people were asking me, you know, the workshop is ending and I'm very sad it's ending. Do you have a book that we can use as a reference now that it's completed? And I said, no, I don't. And they said, well, you need to work on a book. So it's really <laughs> my, <laughs> really my students' fault that I got involved in this book. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, was very inspiring for me. And so basically I went by what they needed and that's mm. how I book. And, uh, I'm really, the book is for emerging writers like yourself, but it's also for published writers or perhaps they were fiction writers and they decide they want to write a memoir and they're you know kind of trying to figure out how they're going to do that. I actually was helping Tom Steinbeck, John Steinbeck's son, write his memoir before he passed. And that mm. was his part. He started with fiction, and just making that transition was difficult for him. So helping him on his path helped me as well write the book. So basically when preparing to write, it's, you know, getting the right mood, having the right place. You know, um, setting is very important, not only in fiction, but then also in the writer's yeah, life. And so, so you're talking about step one of your seven steps is yeah. preparing to write. Sorry, just for, for folks who are not familiar with the book. Okay. Okay, yeah, preparing to write, getting your space ready, having the right time to write. And the second step is really developing your self-awareness, and that can be done through meditation, through yoga, uh, and setting your, you know, having your own special sacred place to write, you know, like Virginia Woolf called it a room of your own. And so that would might involve, you know, setting up and having rituals, for example, before you start to write, and that would involve maybe, you know, having a candle, doing a meditation, having a cup of tea, having a cup of coffee, whatever makes you feel most at home. So that would be step two, cultivating your self-awareness, getting grounded in the moment of your writing. And the third step I formulated was speaking your truth. And that's the most difficult part for a lot of people is getting down to the emotional truth of what's inside of them. Mm. Getting over the fear of writing. People are afraid to really tap into what's going on into their inside of them. They're maybe afraid someone will read it or they're afraid to touch demons that maybe have been haunting them for years. So I try to give people courage to write. So that would be step three, speaking your real truth. Now, this is primarily for memoir writing and nonfiction writing. Of course, for fiction writing, it's a little bit different. And I do have a chapter on fiction writing. Mm -hmm. So chapter four is examining your life, and it's basically looking at your life and seeing what moments were life-changing for you. Because chances are, those are the moments that will pull your heartstrings to write about. Mm. And help people figure out what are those moments. Maybe make a list of those moments and then see which ones 
are most compelling to you. Mm -hmm. And then step five is memoirs, biography, and autobiographical writing. Yeah, it's finding your form, finding out what works best for you. You might just want to do journaling. You know, um, most of my books started in journals because I like the longhand aspect of it. And so if it's journaling, that's fine, too. Or if you want to do memoir, then I have tips on how to start a memoir. If you want to do essays, I have tips on essays and then also fiction writing. Some people and I have a few friends that have written well, written fiction because they really wanted to hide behind the mask of fiction. Uh -huh. They didn't, you know, oftentimes fiction is is it originates in the nonfiction form. They're true stories that people have their fiction license and they can elaborate. Mm -hmm. so, so it's finding your form, uh, which is really important. And that chapter is a big section on journaling because my life has revolved around journaling for many years and having the right journal, getting the right pen. And it's, it's an art like any other art form. Mm -hmm. and letter writing is another art that I talk about. Mm -hmm. And then there's steps six and seven, Unleashing with Poetry, step six. Yeah, Unleashing with Poetry. And my publisher was really happy I put this section in because he said a lot of people are intimidated by poetry, as, as was I in high school. You know, the great poets, Chaucer and Shakespeare, are pretty daunting. Mm -hmm. um, so my the way I teach poetry is making it very accessible and and you know picking an image or picking a feeling that you want to explore in a poem. And I really began writing poetry seriously when I was raising my three kids because I didn't have a lot of time and poetry's really quick. Mm. So uh, that's a form that I, I love as well. I've read a lot of poetry. I've got four collections mm -hmm. of poetry. And it's all very accessible poetry, just about everyday experiences. My first poem was called uh, Parking, and it was all about this man sitting on a park bench watching me park. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of like a male female thing about you know men think women can't drive and can't park and it was um, it was fun to write because mm -hmm. it was an observation that a lot of us have faced you know mm -hmm. over the years so it was fun and then sharing your writing is the last chapter that's not for everyone um, but it's fun to share your stories because it helps other people share their stories mm -hmm. and it's nice to get feedback from people to you know, as to how you've affected their lives with your stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I have but a bunch of questions based on those seven steps, and, and then I want to drill it into um, uh, step five. So um, why is it important? It seems like, um, and so all of this, is, was, as I understand it, was generated from people in the classroom who said, please show, share with me a process. Tell me a little bit about what, what you heard in the classroom and what generated this idea of, okay, you know, what you want to do is find a special space to write. You want to have a sp specific time to write. Why are those things helpful and what was generating that idea of step one? Well, a lot of his mood, you know, just like, you know, if you're a chef, you know, preparing a beautiful plate is very important because it, it's, you're using all your senses when you're eating. So it's the same thing with writing. You're, you need to set, you need to set the mood. Mm. People don't know how to do it. They think that writers just can, you know, write anywhere. Mm -hmm. Most, any of us can, but I think when you're learning to write or you're an emerging writer, you need to have rituals. So it was basically stemmed out of the ritualistic aspect of writing. Okay, so what's your ritual? You're about to start a new book or a poem when you were writing poetry when your kids were younger. What were some of your rituals that you got into to help you set the mood? Some of my rituals were having the space. I always had an office. Sometimes it was at home. Sometimes it was outside the home. And just having a, a, a space of my own, a room of my own, as Virginia Woolf used to say. Then I would often light a white candle. That kind of gets me in the mood. Uh, I would usually meditate before. And I always, I'm a big coffee drinker, although I do love tea. I always have a cup of coffee. Right. So those are kind of your, and what are some other ones that people come up with from your class that are, that, because it seems like you've taught this workshop a lot. So what are some other ones that seem to work or other ideas for, for mood setting? Yeah. Some people like going for a walk first just to get mm -hmm. them in that, in that zone. Some people like sitting outside and working, you know, in nature. Some people like sitting on benches. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago, I used to sit in bookstores when there were more bookstores around and just in the cafes and just that white noise and right. watching people. 
Some other things that people do are, uh, you know, they sharpen their pencils. I... <laughs> right, but they're rituals, right? You're like, okay, I'm getting ready. Whether uh, to me, the candle is kind of like, I'm like, this is the start. I'm lighting the candle. I'm sharpening the pencils. Yeah, Pumping. and then shutting the phone off and shutting your, you know, computer off. It depends if you're doing longhand or, you know, writing also. So, yes, getting rid of all the distractions would mm -hmm. be a really good one. Uh, I have a, a little Buddha on my desk, and on her lap it says there's a little stone that says serenity. So that I just kind of look at that, and I just sort of, okay, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I see. So, like, there's actually, so it's almost like, the, it's, it's interesting because you have your five senses, right? So you have the coffee, which, which is gustatory. You have the visual, which is the Buddha. You know, you have the kinesthetic. I don't know if you have a kinesthetic. Maybe it's a meditation that you talk about beforehand or being outdoors would be kind of a kinesthetic. Uh, I don't know. If, I guess the candle is also olfactory, depending on what. Yes. Yeah. So you're getting all five senses kind of juiced up and ready to set the mood for writing. That's at least yeah. what I'm hearing. <laughs> Definitely, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say kinesthetically. I try to every half hour get up. Mm -hmm. Get you know, especially if you get you're in the flow, you just tend to like sit here. But it's really good to get moving and come back. Yeah, I've heard from. Um, I've interviewed quite a few productivity experts, and they said that you like if you sit, they suggest no longer than an hour. So I actually have this um, Buddhist gong that goes. Bing! And I'm like, okay. And I like, a, as a robot, I get up like a robot and just walk around. And then I also have this thing, which is like a Fitbit. Oh, uh, yeah. And then what it does is this particular Fitbit um, buzzes every hour. So I know. And it says, go step 250 steps. So oh. then I walk around the block or I go outside. And it's actually really from a physical way so that kinesthetically you can get the blood moving and oxygen flowing so that yep. you have kind of a renewed sense of energy, I guess, is how yeah. I would describe it. Yes. Yes, so yes. those are some other tips that I've heard. All right. So how about um, step two? Um, and, and what's interesting that you had talked, um, you talked to a whole bunch of people because the primary thing that you were interested in, in was to understand how people use writing for healing. And um, I love that chapter because there's so many examples of people who have used writing as, um, as healing. And in fact, the thing that I'm writing is about my son leaving for college. Oh. Yeah. So it's just, it, it's the same kind of, you know, uh, uh, a major transition in life and whether it's a death, which my father died, you know, 18 years ago or um, so kind of around, you know, a little bit before my kids are born. So I'm writing about that. But what did the folks that you interviewed that talked about the healing process and what happens when you write in a memoir fashion or write generally? So your question was what happens in their process, basically? Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what's, what's the healing that comes about? Well, it's very interesting. Everyone's different, of course. Uh, but I always suggest people start writing from a, from a question. Mm -hmm. Like, what is your question about what you're writing about? I started writing my first memoir, Why Did My Grandmother Commit Suicide? Um, Maxine Con Kingston, who wrote The Women's Warrior, she wrote about her aunt having this secret about, you know, her aunt committing suicide. And she suddenly decided to write because everyone had passed away and she wanted to share that secret that was kept in the family mm. for many years. She had an illegitimate child, if anyone has not read the memoir. And someone else wrote about, or said that they wrote because their their brother died and they were trying to figure out, they were trying to figure out a way to keep, his, he was trying to figure out a way to keep his brother alive and he found mm. through the writing process that was one way to keep his brother alive. Mm. Yeah. And there are a lot, most, a lot of people write out of self-discovery. They have a question they need answered. Hmm. So it's almost figuring out what question you need answered and then answering it. And what happens to the reader when the writer answers the question? It really depends on, on the story, but they can be, you know, they can be changed. They can, you know, have certain, you know, epiphanies. They can be empowered by the story hmm. and that could inspire them to write their own story. So it really depends on the story we're talking about. Yeah, I, the, one of the things that you write in the book that I think is interesting is the, and what I found, at least in my own writing, is that, 
you know, answering a question each time I go back, I'm like, did I really answer the question? What's really going on? And it's, um, and you mentioned this in the book, but there's this process of the revision of the book, like revising and editing. And I'm like, no, this is noise. It's really this. And is it really this thing? You know, so, um, uh, an example would be, um, I was writing about, um, uh, dropping my son, you know, the pain that I was feeling before we dropped off, the anticipatory grief that I was feeling before dropping off my son. And, you know, the, I would, I would write just about the grief itself. So I thought, oh, I'm feeling awful. I feel like I pit my stomach. I keep on crying, you know, that kind of stuff. And cool. then I know it's, it's, it's sad and a little <laughs> bit pathetic, but I, would, but I would write. A lot of people can relate to it though. That's the good I know, but I think it's, and I'm writing it mostly because I think people can relate to it, right? So um, what I found in my coaching is that when you normalize what is normal, not that there is any normal, right? But there's a gamut of, of range of expressions on what's normal and, or not. And so I, and I'm going, and I'm literally when I'm writing, trying to write every single emotion that comes up I mean and physical reaction like now the reason it may feel uncomfortable talking to me because I can't it's feeling uncomfortable just even saying anything because I can't breathe Aww. like I have not been able to breathe and I have no idea why but I can't breathe <laughs> and so it's you know it's like that kind of stifling emotional response and so I'm just writing through all these things and as I'm writing contemplating myself why can't I why can't I breathe? It's kind of formulating like, well, it's because, you know, so I'll give you examples. It's because I'm trying to control my emotional response. So if I feel like if I take deep breaths, I would have to breathe in life energy. And if I breathe in life energy, then all hell will break loose because I'll fall into a pool of a bucket of tears. But you know what I mean? Like those yes. kinds of I'm things. Happy. But as I'm writing each day that passes like why can't I breathe right. I realize that there's more insight that comes and so for me I don't even know what I'm going to do with this writing it could be publish it it could be like put it in a notebook I, I really don't know what doesn't form it, take. The, the, it doesn't matter the important thing is that you're writing and and I love the idea that you're writing about your feelings because a lot of people write you know they could write about the scene about dropping your son off and what he looked like and what the school looked like and what the people you know that you left him with looked like but the fact the difference between, and that's kind of just like reportage, like a journalist would do, but personal writing, like memoir and essays, you're really expressing how you feel about the experience that you're going through. And this is exactly what you're doing, which is beautiful. And, you know, what you're writing about has a universal truth. There's some, we've all dropped our kids off at school. And so certainly it'll, the story will resonate, you know, which is another reason to publish. It will resonate with a lot of people. So do you say, you, um, in the book, you talk about episodic writing. Is that what you mean? Like, I did this, and I did that. I dropped him off at school, and then he was wearing this. And I was feeling, like, that's kind of episodic. Is that episodic writing? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, yeah. Kind of serial, con um, sequential writing. Yeah, like, uh, it's more like sh telling and not showing. And so that's another thing I talk about. It's better to show, you know, like, what did your emotions feel like at that? How did you react at that moment that you dropped him off? And... How was he reacting? You know, people want to hear both sides as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, so I get it. And I think that that's interesting because I think that um, the fear I have is, isn't this, you know, the Elizabeth Gilbert, she wrote that great memoir about um, uh, traveling and what, I can't even remember the name of it, but um, yeah. what, was, what was it called again? Pray Love. E Pray Love. Um, it, it feels wildly, the common the negative commentary, I love the book, but a lot of people are like, oh, it's so wildly indulgent. <laughs> and so, and when you write about a personal memoir, and, and I'm emoting all over the place in this thing, right? So it's kind of like, how do you get to the point that you're not just like a big open emoting yeah. sore that everyone's like, shut it up, shut, put a Band-Aid on it, put some salve on it, just shut up, give us a little story. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think I may do a little bit too much. One of the people read it, and she's like, I just kept on crying when I read your thing because it reminded me. I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's – maybe that maybe that's what I'm trying to inspire. I don't even know because I'm just writing my emotions. And So how do you get so you're not wildly emotionally indulgent and there's a little bit of like, just shut up already, lady. Um <laughs> 
Well, we call that navel gazing. Navel you know? gazing. Okay. How do you prevent yourself from navel? Oh, I'm doing a ton of that. <laughs> Uh, well, I think in the first draft, I tell people just let it rip, just write whatever. And the second draft, the third drafts, or in many cases, 20 drafts later, you can you know, figure out how you want to bring in a universal truth, which is not just about yourself, but it's how does, how does this apply to other people in your similar situation? And how, do, how, how can it resonate with them? And actually, the fact that you're making people cry is good. You want to invoke emotion in your readers. So that's a good thing. Okay. It means you're a good writer. I don't know about that, but um, I did make people cry. <laughs> I, I tend to do that with my coaching. <laughs> don't know what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything on purpose. Um, okay. But there are all sorts of things that you talk about. Um, uh, these techniques. So there's mindfulness and uh, loving kindness meditation and guided creative and breath work and dream work and, and all these different things. Um, thinking about your shadow. Um, do you incorporate these because these are different ways of getting into the state of tapping into your, you had talked about earlier. It's so important to tap into your heart and your emotions. Are those techniques used to tap into your emotions or how do you use all these different techniques when you're actually writing? Yes, they are. They're ways to tap into your emotions. Some some people really believe in their dreams, or you know, st it's a way to tap into your subconscious mind. And so, it's good to write your dreams down in a dream journal right beside your bed. And sometimes they're it can be useful in your daytime writing. Mm. Uh, and you know, we ha we don't very often tap into our shadows, and so it's a good thing to study our shadows as well. So yes, it's you can use those some of those techniques in your journaling, and maybe there's snippets. Like I always say, in a, in a journal, there's Maybe 5% that's valuable material that you can use later. 95% is garbage, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's wrong. Okay, so it's really, um, so it's really just um, that that is to get into, it's, if I were to map all the things that you said, it's almost like it's your, if you're trying to get at a universal truth, if you really tap into your psyche, um, then whether it's through their shadow or looking at the Buddha or whoever you're maybe an inspired writer that you talk, a writer that inspires you as a muse. These are all ways to tap your psyche or unconscious. Is that, is that why these techniques, what do you think they're doing? Well, I think that for everyone it's different, but I think basically it grounds you in the present. It grounds you to like the person you are, grounds you and, and makes you connect to your authentic self basically. Mm. Okay, got it. And when you were, um, um, uh, you were talking about writing students, and you said one of the things that's hardest for them is to get into their heart. So what, what, if, if, uh, what does that look like when you're not getting into your heart? I, I, I'm, I think I'm always there, so I honestly, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what it means not to be there. It, that's, that probably sounded obnoxious, but it, it didn't. No, it I didn't. didn't. To yeah. be obnoxious. <laughs> They give it as a blessing. Okay. So what is it? How do you know if you're not in your heart or being authentic? Well, you start telling and not showing. You start saying, well, I dropped my son off at school and, you know, he's wearing a blue shirt and there was a guy standing next to him. You, you're, you're not giving any emotions. You're not talking about how you feel about the experience. You're just being a reporter. Mm. You know, you're not tapping into your emotions and the emotional self and your authentic self. Why do people need to see that emotional or authentic self? I think they relate to it. Mm. I think that's, that's what connects us as humans is the emotions that we are experiencing, you know, through experience that we're feeling through experiences. Mm. And so you talk about embodying as a way of kind of uh, maybe that's like a kinesthetic experiential sense, like the sun kissed my face as I was blah, blah, blah. Or, um, so is that what you mean? So those are kind of universal feelings that people have. Is that, is that what yeah. the embodied piece was? Um, and, but, well, I think I, what you might be referring to is I talk about embodied writing and yes. that's like you're writing from, from your body. You know, I, I believe that experiences sit somewhere in our body somewhere, you know, if we've mm. had a, my, there's a place that it sits and and so if you can tap into where that place is that you're writing from whether it's your you know your heart your sexuality your head I, I try to encourage people not to write too much from their head in this kind of writing because we get too intellectual in that way I mean there's a place for that but 
if you just write from your heart and feel, just feel the emotions on the page and using all your senses, like you described earlier is very important. That's how we tap into all of our emotions. Mm, okay. So I'm, I'll tell you what I'm feeling and maybe you can help coach me out of what I could write that's useful. <laughs> so over the last week, um, now this goes into therapy. <laughs> now you're the therapist, but maybe you can be my co- my writing therapist. So over the last couple of weeks, you know, I haven't been able to breathe. And um, I wake up in the morning and literally feel a visceral feeling where my heart either feels super heavy or I have like an ache right around my ovaries. Like I have no freaking idea what's going on. But it's like a, a heaviness or a sense of emptiness. Like I wake up and it feels like my whole, like I've been gutted like a fish. So what would one, like... Is that what you mean? Is that interesting to other people? <laughs> I'm looking at your face and there's a sense of revulsion. <laughs> what I'm telling you. No, there's no revulsion. I'm fascinated. No, 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 not at all. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to direct you is mm-hmm. what I, that expression. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tap into what your heart is feeling at that moment? I mean, you, you said you have feeling in your ovary as well. Can you put your my mind your, there? Your mind into your your mind in, and your all your senses into your ovaries and see if your ovaries are giving you a message. I know that my breath is giving me a message, which is about control and like if I feel like if I don't let my breath in, somehow I'm con- I have control over the experience. That's one. Mm-hmm. When I've tuned into my heart, and what I mean, what I think you mean by this is I literally have a dialogue with my heart where I'm like, hey, what's going on? It's just a sense of um, loss, like a, just a sense of loss and emptiness because there was someone in there that's, of course, still in there, but there's a sense of emptiness. So I'm not even sure what's emptied out. It's just a space, just like he's cleared out of her house and there's a room that's now empty and he's still in my heart, right? But there's a space in my heart that's not that doesn't sound right like it's not that the space is not as big but there's an emptiness right because he's fled the nest yeah yeah so what about writing him a letter you don't have to send it but what about writing him a letter about all your feelings sometimes i suggest people do that you don't have to send it um but just sometimes that's a way to connect with the person that you're missing right yeah you can send it you can send it oh no (laughs) there's a (laughs) I'm part of this writing group. I'm part of this writing group. And there's a woman who is a youngin in psychology. And she's like, and whatever you do, do not send this letter. (laughs) I know you'll feel tempted and you'll feel like it's just a connective tissue thing. But really what you're doing is helping, preventing him to go from the next developmental stage. So do not 15, 20 years from now send the letter but do not and then that's what I'm using I'm writing a letter because yep. it's a lot easier for me to write to him than mm-hmm. it is to like some anonymous face that I don't even know who I'm writing to and how yeah. do you feel after you do that um after I go through these writings um I have to say that um before shipping them off to college I was going through all sorts of emotions and because I've done so much spiritual work I would take Buddhist texts and, and I'm interviewing all these spiritual folks, right? Like writing for your bliss. That's a spiritual kind of idea. So I'm integrating like, you know, this person I talked to said this about this. And I think impermanence is like the Buddhist concept that this most relates to is that you're gone, but you're never really gone. And so even though the physical aspect of you is gone, mm-hmm. we're always connected by spirit together. Like stuff like that is how I, yeah. and that was really healing. For me, it was healing for me. And I don't know if it's healing for other people because they may not resonate with any of the spiritual stuff. They may not even want to hear my conclusions because it goes against their religious upbringing. I don't really even know how much to share about my insights. Do you have any thoughts? How much to share about your insights? Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Why would you hold back? Because there come, some of them are religious and have a religious tonality to it. Are we talking about writing or verbally? Verbally. Oh, verbally. Yeah, you have to be 
you have to edit a little bit verbally depending on who you're talking to. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I mean about like, well, um, yeah. And how much do you, you're talking about writing close to the bone? Um, what did that mean for you when you're writing about your grandmother's suicide? And how did you, and you said that at, there were some points that were just so raw that you had to stop writing and go get therapy. Can you tell us a little bit? And that's, that's I think, like, that's where you want to go, right? Yeah, that means you're healing in one way or another. I mean, uh, James Pennebaker, who's done a lot of a lot of research on writing for healing, says, you know, you write, write and write and write, but when it starts really hurting, you should stop. And that's a good time to take a break. And mm. so, um, you know, the, no pain, no gain, basically, it's the old adage. But, you know, the rewards are huge after you've written something that is meaningful to you and to others. Uh, you know, I donated the proceeds of Regina's Closet, which was my first memoir about my grandmother, to the uh, American Foundation of Suicide Prevention because mm -hmm. I really think that sharing stories, I'm a big storytelling sharer, and I think that helps other people heal from their own trauma. And yes, I did need some therapy, but I think with me basically more writing, my, my writing was therapy. Mm. And what were, the, what were the insights that you came from about suicide after writing about your grandma? Well, what happened with me is I started writing about her after my first diagnosis of cancer. Mm. And I thought maybe she committed suicide because it was in the 60s. I thought maybe she committed suicide because of cancer. And that's why, that was my question, is that mm. why you died? Mm -hmm. And so as I wrote and researched, I realized that wasn't the reason. The reason she committed suicide was because she had some demons from her childhood. Mm. She was orphaned in World War One at the age of 11, and so she was left on her own for many, many years. Uh, so that was my discovery. But it was hard to know that she had all that pain that hurt me. That made me sad. I cried a lot. Mm. I almost wanted to know it when she was alive, but of course, she died when I was 10, so she probably wouldn't have told me all those things. I discovered her journal, actually. Mm. That's about her life so that's the other thing about journaling is you're you know whoa where'd you go oh I i'm lost... still here oh i lost you for a second yeah do they cut us off nope we're still here okay uh and so uh yeah i found her journal so that's another thing writing in journals is uh it's a way to keep your family um to share with your family after you're gone it's a beautiful thing yeah mm. And when you read through the journals, what were the insights that you got that you didn't have? Um, was it the demons that you were talking about, about her um, experience uh, as, you said, 11-year-old? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I learned, well, first of all, she was an unwanted child. She was the youngest, and she had three older brothers. And I, I sensed that she was an accident. And her mother didn't want a girl in those days, mm -hmm. in the because she said girls have a really hard time in the world. Mm. So she was felt unwanted and then uh, and she was abandoned at age 11. So she had a lot of stuff to deal with. And now people go to therapy, but in the 50s and 60s, that wasn't wasn't the thing. So and I also learned that she went and tried to go to med school. She tried to get into medical school. Um, she didn't get accepted, but she didn't have the money, but she had the brains. So she tried many things to help her to find bliss, basically, but she just was, she struggled. Mm. And she how did that, when you were writing that, how did it relate to your life, if, if at all? Like, did you see the patterns? Because you talk about examining your life and your life purpose and, and you know, themes. Um, how did that help relate to the themes in your life, or did it? Yes, I think that's a really great question because she um, she was very um, affected by the losses in her life, as was I. I lost a lot of loved ones in my life, which always drove me to writing. So we did have a lot of parallels. We found solace in writing. We were very affected by losses. And, uh, you know, we had we had some similarities. I wish that she was still alive. But writing the, writing the memoir really kept her alive longer. Mm -hmm. And I felt better once I realized that she needed to take her life because she just couldn't find bliss. Mm. I mean, she just couldn't. Uh, she had a bad marriage. She had trauma from the past. She just couldn't find peace in her heart. 
And she committed suicide just about the time that I became very independent because she was my caretaker. And she didn't feel needed anymore. Oh, wow. Wow. And it's right around the same age, right? Because you said she was orphaned at 10. And then I know that you said that your grandmother was your primary caretaker. So right around the same age, you're, you know, left alone from your primary caretaker. So a lot of interesting parallels. Um, I haven't, sorry, I haven't read Regina's Closet yet, but I see lots of really interesting parallels. How, How does one... And so you talk about step four, examining your life and talking about, you know, life purpose and themes and the meaning of experiences and the patterns in our lives. How did that, um, do you include that so that someone can start when they're writing, seeing those things and are they, do they become an organizing principle or how does one take the themes and the purpose and the meaning and weave it into a book? You're asking fabulous questions. That's a great question. <laughs> uh, well, it's, you know, like I talked about finding a life change, writing about, or maybe like making a list of life changing events in your life. Mm-hmm. And then chances are, even if you go through your journals, I suggest people go through their journals and highlight themes and they'll find that they have the similar themes throughout that they write about, whether it's loss, love, sadness, abandonment, joy, whatever there, there seems to be. Th- so those kinds of things is probably what is going to be highlighted in the book. And, and also um, making a list of all those life-changing events will also, there probably will be themes that connect, connect them, connect mm. those. Themes. Yeah. And it, and it wasn't until reading that chapter for me that, and I think the, one of the hardest things for my son leaving is that I have a very similar relationship a lot of talking, talking late at night before my son went to sleep, which is exactly the same relationship I had with my dad, who was very dear to my heart, who passed when I was like very, you know, relatively young, 35. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I could see, I think a lot of the experience, traumatic experiences I'm having are mapped to his death, mm-hmm. you know, and, and just the shock of it. In this case, Unlike my dad's death, which was he died of a heart attack. So he's like, boom, gone. In this case, I've been trying to like manage the whole thing <laughs> so yeah. that I'm not in shock because I've, I've experienced that transition and shock. So what would one do with this information? Would, what would I do specifically with this information? So I know that one of my um, life, big life experiences is mm-hmm. being lost without a loved one and mm-hmm. then finding who I am and what I love afterwards, like my dad's death resulted in my doing a transformational change from who I was to who I am now. And I don't know if the same thing's going to happen with my son. Um, so are these the kinds of, how does one explore these things in writing and put it around as, do, would you create a structure? What, what should I do with this information? <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, I don't think you should become obsessed with what to do with it. I would just say just write. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does sound like you've been re-traumatized. Yeah. By the loss of your, not the loss of your son, but your son going away, you know. Right. And so I think bringing up a lot of memories about your father, which is, it's very difficult. I'm sure it's very difficult for you. So, you know, with me, my healing, you know, whatever whatever makes you feel good, whether it's, I don't know if you, you know, do any kind of exercise, but exercise and writing, mingling the two, the things that make you feel better but getting it on the page has got to be healing for you. And, and it sounds like you're also trying to pull it together, maybe into a book and you're trying to figure out structure that structure in a memoir is the most difficult part of writing a memoir. Mm. Um, my first memoir, I tried like 20 different structures before I got the one that was right. <gasps> or that's hard. a little bit depressing to me. <laughs> I know, but you know what? It comes, it's, it's almost, it becomes a challenge. You're like, how am I going to structure this? Uh, but you know, after you do a lot of revisions, it falls into place. It does. It does. Fall. Okay. So I have to have, have faith that this will all come into, don't worry about how all these quilt pieces are going to be yeah. sewn together. That it will somehow be logical in the end. The other thing I'm noticing, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Writing is a process. It's not something that there's no formula. It's a process of discovery that you have to figure out what's going to be right for your words. It's a right. process. I can give you guidelines, but you've got to figure out where the pieces go but the thing with the memoirs is a thread running through it you know my grandmother's memoir was about loss and illness and every memoir has a a thread or a focus 
Right, that you may not see until you look at all these different big moments in your life and go, oh, I see how this is all fitting together. And then when you get them, you can weave them together perhaps 20 times, but you'll still. (laughs) One of the things that I'm noticing is um, the themes that I keep on coming up with is impermanence, impermanence. I was like, I just keep on writing. And then it's like, and I'm concluding impermanence. I'm like, I'm either really dim-witted and like (laughs) have one insight (laughs) like the insights they're all about like you never lose i mean it's we're always connected we're always one there is no separate self you know that kind of thing where everything is impermanent and and it just seems like the same darn conclusion each time and then i don't feel so insightful um (laughs) does it it matter (laughs) it doesn't matter don't don't become caught in in it. Okay, I'm like, I'm just like, you know, two trick, maybe three trick pony. <laughs> it comes down to the same three major insights. <laughs> Granted, they're important ones, but I'm like, well, how much insight can you give when it's just the same three damn things that you say over and over again? Okay, I'm not going to worry about that then. Don't worry about it. Don't obsess about it. Just, just let it flow. Okay. All right. Step five of which... Um, um, I found these really interesting. Now, tell me, you when we were talking earlier, like, oh, I don't like this chapter. <laughs> Why don't you like this chapter, this step? Oh, I think you were talking. I thought you were talking about step five in the in the later chapter, um, where I talked about writing. You know who your audience is. I thought that's. What oh you were no, talking. no! I was talking about. I love all the like show don't tell. I think that that's brilliant. Um, and you have a whole bunch of tips in here. Um, you, you talk about, um, like, writing the hero's journey is one format. And is that, mm-hmm. like, how, how – part of when I'm writing is I don't even know how to structure this so that there's kind of a – so. Yeah. And, and when I started writing in my kind of crazy, flowy kind of way, it would be, like, for when my son was leaving for college, I would write – I would think about the past, and then I would think about the, uh, the current – and then I would knit into it the future. And I have no idea. It's not like if I, it's not like I came up with this writing style. It just, that was what was happening organically. And someone said, I love this. You should keep this. Cause I kind of, I could follow your thread, but there was just a sense yeah. of movement and I could knit yeah. and synthesize stuff. And it, yeah. it was beautiful. And I was like, Oh, do I have to write that way the whole time? <laughs> I don't know if I can. <laughs> it was almost like, ah, um, <laughs> In a memoir, does there have to be kind of a consistent storytelling way um, or not? Well, there's different structures, as I said, for memoirs. But basically, memoirs are written like novels. There has to be, you know, there should be, a, there's a plot. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's dialogue. There's a, you know, peak experience. And then, you know, one day. And so it, um, it, it's written in a very similar way. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's got to be characters, and if you bring a character into a novel, just like when you bring a character into a memoir, there's got to be a reason you're bringing the character in. You know, you're writing about your son, and suddenly you're talking about a neighbor that's walking the dog outside your house. Well, why'd you bring that neighbor into mm. the story? If there's no reason for that person, then just they don't need to be there. Right. So it's, um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but... Yeah, you are, because I think that sometimes when in telling in, in an episodic way, there was like, I ran yeah. into the person at Starbucks. So yeah. I'm writing about yeah. how I'm so at a loss that uh, the coffee yeah. drink that I've ordered over the last 20 years, I can't even order at Starbucks. Uh, that's <laughs> so depressing. Th- <laughs> it's depressing. Uh, that's really so I'm <laughs> writing about how I'm... I'm as, an, as evidence of how incredibly lost I am, that I can't even do the basic things that I've done for the last 20 years, just because yeah. I can't for whatever reason, because I'm so unbelievably lost. So that's the Brees is not that important. I don't know if I bring her in, but I bring in that experience in there. Um, and then I, I think I brought in something about how um, when we were bringing the babies back, when we brought our, my first eldest back how we didn't know how to change a diaper and I felt so (laughs) incredibly lost like we went through four diapers until we could actually put this diaper on this thing that weighed you know this little baby that weighed like eight pounds and was like this big (laughs) but but I but is that 
sounds like a flashback to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I have lots of flashbacks. Yeah. Throughout the time. Is that a storytelling method or is it? Yeah, sure. Okay. It is. But just have to make sure to keep your theme in mind. Like what is like, what's the, what's the purpose of this book? Um, it's to really think... help. It's to help people know what to expect when they're first. It's for people who are empty nesters or people who are sending their college off. I think a lot of the helicoptering snowplow moms, of which I am part of, it's really hard now to let go of your kids, and we are overdoing it in so many ways. So as a result, this transition is far more catastrophic than it really needs to be, or that it, I don't know, it's just not needs to be. It's more catastrophic because we've invested more, so it takes out more out of us. So it's helping people just get a preview. So what I'm trying to understand, is it a self-help book you're thinking of writing or is it a memoir? Memoir. Yeah. It's a memoir. Okay. It's a self-help you... book disguised as a memoir. <laughs> disguised <laughs> as a okay. memoir. I don't have yeah. enough self-help stuff. To, I just, I hate those. Like, here's a seven. I, I just can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, no, I mean, whatever feels right to you. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what, so then I think, well, should I talk, you know, I don't know if there's organizing principles. And once you find one, if it has to be consistently portrayed throughout the whole book so that it's not jarring for the reader. Um, don't worry about that now. Okay, don't. So I'm actually getting too far into technical. Just get the words on the page. You know, I, it's the worst thing that we can do as writers is to edit as we go. Because okay. what that does is that it, it um, stifles the creative process. Right, right, okay. It's like get it on the page and then, and you can actually do it in anecdotes. You know, you can do, you know, you can do the diaper thing and then you could do when he went off to kindergarten and then we went off to, you know, element, uh, elementary school and then we went off to middle school and then high school and now college and then the anecdotes and then you can sort of figure out the, the order later. Right, okay, so don't worry about it. Get it on paper and then you'll... The, the merging will happen later. Okay. And then you talk about one thing, which I'm all really guilty of is metaphor. I may use six different metaphors in one because my mind thinks in metaphors. Um, is that also something like worry about that later? Don't worry about metaphors. Don't stress about it. Okay. I don't mean to stress you out with all my little tips, tidbits. Oh no. You know what? I'm kind of, um, I stress my own self out okay. because I'm trying to reach a certain perfection. Uh, it, and not being someone who was ever a writer and actually who was told I can't write when I was a little kid, that you're an awful writer and you shouldn't be writing and writing is your weakest subject. It's really hard. So I'm trying to learn what I missed then, or do you know what I mean? So part of it is like learning the techniques and such is super helpful for me. And what I'm hearing you say is don't worry about it. Worry about all of this later. Just it's about getting what's in getting here down on paper on the page. okay that's my main takeaway all right um any other closing thoughts for people out there who we have two more minutes what are some of the things that from people who've read your book i know it's just it's coming out soon right no. well it came out on uh september 1st it's out oh yay Came out on friday and i got three of the toppest re toppest that's not anymore top <laughs> reviews from <laughs> Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, and uh, what's the third one? The Forward Review. So my publisher calls me the three crowned writer. Nice. <laughs> really happy. And I hope it helps a lot of people. So in terms of closing words, uh, I would just say have no fear. Just let it rip. Just write. I mm. think fear is the biggest thing that stops us all from writing from our hearts. Mm. Okay. Have no fear. Is that what keeps us from, is that what writer's block is all about? Is it just basically fear? It could be. Okay. Be courageous. Be courageous in, in presenting your voice. What? Be courageous in what way? Be courageous in just, yes, just touching into your heart and saying what you want to say without fear that somebody's going to read it and what are they going to think. Don't think about what other people are going to think. Just write what you want to write. Mm -hmm. Tap into your emotional truth. I used to have a sticky on my computer that said, on my screen that said, tap into your emotional truth. And mm -hmm. that Mm. I made that transition from, sorry, from, from being a journalist to being a memoir writer. And so that transition was hard because um, you're not allowed to put your emotions. It used to be in the olden days. 
journalists to not put their emotions <laughs> into their writing. Now things are different. Oh, um, how things have changed. I wish it was like the old days again. <laughs> so tell us if people would like to sign up to your class um, as we close. Uh, what, where should they go? What, what, what's your website? Where should they go if they want more to buy the book? Um, go sign up for classes. Well, you can go to my website, dianarab.com. That's D-I-A-N-A-R-A-A-B.com. And there's events there. There's, you know, what I'm doing, where I'm speaking, where I'm signing. And if you want me to come to your hometown, I might, if I get a good offer, I might do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be in Seattle and New York and Fort Lauderdale because I kids live in those places and also a lot in California. Uh, my book is available on Amazon or wherever books are sold. That You can go to your local bookstore and you can order it. Uh, that's basically it. Thank you. And then you have writing courses of people. Are they online writing courses? No, I don't do online. I like face-to-face. Okay. So under the events part on my website, events, under events, it says where I'll be. Okay. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much. All right. Great. Thank you, everyone. Everyone have a great week. We've uh, and put your book up again. We've been talking to Diana Rabb about her book, Writing for Bliss, and it just came out. Woohoo! Yay! All right. Thanks for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great talking. Ciao. You're fired up with CJ. You can join the conversation. Contact CJ Lou yourself. Subscribe to her YouTube channel and find her Facebook page. And check out more shows online now. Get links to it all at firedupwithcj.com. Well, well, I did well. I stopped exactly at 150. <laughs> no, it's over. You went 52. What? No, I have 151 on my um 150 on my phone on my I think the recording the, has one uh the recording has 52 point whatever. Really? No, but that's because I called you beforehand. No, it doesn't start recording when you it doesn't start recording until the um the disclaimer oh, comes off. I don't know what's happening because I'm looking at my clock. It's 152. Anyhow, Diana, okay. thank you. I start, did, did I actually um, throw a couple of? I, you looked a little bit shocked and dismayed during my questions. No, you didn't. No, you made you made me think a lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to thinking on these shows. I'm just kind of like a robot. <laughs> you made- <laughs> um, CJ, real quick. I don't yes. know if y'all seen the questions come in. There was two questions. Uh, you might have wanted to address. How do you tap into the inside? How do you tap into the inside to write? And will these Will this book help write all kinds of things? Oh, okay. The insight oh, to write? that on the website. What? Insight to write? How do you tap into the insight to write or inside? Inside. Inside yourself. Inside. And to then, write. And then what was the other question? Will this book help write all kinds of things? Um, meaning, I'm assuming they're asking about yeah, memoirs, yeah. poetry, journaling, novels fiction you know y'all were yeah. talking about that's when it came in can you actually um do me a favor and just or can you spend two minutes answering these questions and then um i'll tell can you just tell folks on the um line that we will answer those questions and for them to check it out on youtube on the youtube channel yeah yes thank you my dear do you mind staying you for two minutes and we'll answer these questions Anna? y'all should send yes. me the book <laughs> okay another appointment let me just tell them to buy the book yeah um okay one okay. question was the uh, yeah, so yeah so so I'm, so so one of the questions that we had online was how do you tap into the insight to write? We talked about that in terms of you know tapping into your emotional truth, which is basically you know chapter three. Chapter three. So get the book and then read chapter three if you want to get into in those tips. And then the next one was um, aside from memoirs, we talked a lot about memoirs. We talked about personal essays. Will these techniques help? Have you found that they they help ever you know other writers? Yes, they help all the genres, and that would be chapter five, which is finding your form. Okay. And that would be about you know fiction, nonfiction. Sorry, fiction, memoir, poetry. Essay. Yeah. Excellent. Probably not journalists, though, right? Not well. Oh, no, not really. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. Good Thank day. you. Good luck with your writing. Good Thank you. Your... Thanks. All right. Bye. Okay. Thank Ciao. you. Bye. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.